Welcome back to Anti-War Radio. It's Chaos 95.9 FM in Austin, Texas. We're also streaming live worldwide on the internet at chaosradioaustin.org and at antiwar.com slash radio. And uh, I'm very happy to welcome back to the show Dilip Hero. He's the author of five books on Iran. The latest is called The Iranian Labyrinth, Journeys Through Theocratic Iran and Its Furies. He's, his uh, most recent article at antiwar.com, it's in uh, the Tom Englehart archives there at original.antiwar.com slash Englehart. It's called The Weeks of Living Dangerously, The Clash of Islam and Democracy in Iran. Welcome back to the show. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure. Uh, so this is a really uh, interesting article. You really kind of give us uh, a real background of the history and the politics of uh, well, Iranian civilization, uh, you know, since the revolution and uh, the, the various clashing uh, cultural forces at play between the Ayatollahs and, uh, and the young and that kind of thing. So I guess I'd just like to, you know, give you carte blanche to sort of, you know, uh, tell us what you think is important for us to understand about who the Iranian people are, what that society is really like, and, and then, you know, we can get into the, the actual conflict of the election and, and recent events. Absolutely. I think basically what happens, and this is a kind of a, should I say, newspaper headline, all revolutions have problems when they get to be about 20 to 25 years old. Because what happens is that uh, the new generation which has come up after the revolution doesn't really know what was the situation before the revolution happened. And that particular job is supposed to be done by the education system, because after every major revolution, education textbooks are changed, and the new system tries to socialize young and uh, coming up generation into what was before, why things are better now. Now, of, of course, this is for the revolution in Iran, but quite simply, revolution means that all the established power structure of a country is completely overthrown. And that's basically what happened in Iran. Of course, I also remember something very interesting, which is that all the revolutions before the Iranian Revolution were secular revolutions, and they were focused on, uh, they were class revolution, to change the property and class relations in society. Iran's revolution was not like that. Iran's revolution was based in religion. Now, this may come as a big surprise to us, the people, but of course, you know, even if you go back to the, I'm, I'm talking last century, I'm not going back to the French Revolution, because the French Revolution was anti-clerical. But it's if you take the last uh, century, 1910, Mexican Revolution was the first one, then Bolshevik Revolution, and so on. So I think what happened was well, that's where I come to Iranian history. We have two things to keep in mind. One is that 90% of Iranians, 90, 98% are Muslim. Amongst them, 90% of the total population are Shiite Islam, and only 8% are Sunni. Now, in Shiite Islam, the, uh, the, the mullahs, or what they call ayatollahs, or whatever, they have independent existence from the state. If you take the Sunni state like uh, Egypt, there the preachers are basically civil servants of the state. Turkey is the same. But in uh, Shia country, uh, Shia country, you have an independent uh, base for the religious organizations, the religious leaders. And that was what happened that in the days of the Shah, a conflict arose between the religious side and the Shah of Iran, who was nominally a Shiite Muslim, but he was a secular, he was totally allied with America in the Cold War, and that was a big gap. And in that gap came in um, Ayatollah called Khomeini, not Khamenei, Khomeini, Ruhollah Khomeini. He acted in a very, shall I say, innovative way, i.e. he combined Islam, Shiite Islam with nationalism, and anti-imperialism. Now that's something quite an amazing to do. And so he, he let me give one quick example. In Shia Islam, martyrdom is to be desired, i.e. 
if you die in the name of Islam, uh, then you go to heaven and interesting things happen to you. Now, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not, but you have to accept that it's a belief which is prevalent in Iranian society. And so what he would do when the Shah's soldiers started to shoot people and kill them, in Islam, you have a 40-day mourning. On the 40th day of the death of somebody, then you have a procession or a memorial service. And so what Khomeini would do is, when uh, the Shah's soldiers killed the people in demonstrations, then he would call on people on the 40th day to come out and demonstrate in a big way. And then more people will be shot, and to the next 40 days you get it's still a bigger demonstration, you see. And that is how he built up the momentum. So see, the Shia and Islam is, and martyrdom is a very important aspect to understand. The second thing that he did was the, he combined not only the religious people, but also leftists, secular people, Marxists of uh, various shades. He also combined them to have one single objective, one simple uh, and simple and powerful objective, throw away the Shah of Iran, throw away the dynasty of the Shah of Iran. Now, that's a very radical uh, platform on which to combine so many disparate organizations, religious, secular, and the Marxist, all of them, they want to get to the Shah. And that achievement was supposed to be superhuman, but it came about, you see. But that's the background. Now, what's happening is that, of course, the young generation which has come up in Iran, I mean, they don't remember, of course, they were not around, and the education system has not actually explained or communicated to them how bad this, the Shah's regime was. See, that's one. Secondly, in this day and age, it's very difficult for any regime, whether it's the religious regime or secular regime or authoritarian or democratic, to have a firewall for the people. You know, we live in the age of Internet. We live in the age of uh, you know, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter, and so on and so forth. And, and that is something which, again, goes against the uh, mullahs, because mullahs would like to admit control it, but they cannot actually, you know, go against the, uh, what you call the oncoming technology. And also remember, the mullahs, uh, the re regime has not completely shut down the Internet system. In Burma, for example, they completely shut down the Internet system for six weeks. In Iran, they haven't done it because Internet is a very important part of the industry and business. And Iran has a developed industry and oil industry, so it, the government simply cannot afford to shut down the whole thing because that will affect the whole GDP. So I'm just giving you the background that there is a growing gap between the aging uh, um, theocracy and the religious leaders and the young generation which has come up, basically young people who are less than 30 years old, and also women. See, women uh, are, you know, uh, required to wear Islamic dress. If man and woman, unless they are married, they cannot even hold hands in public, and that is very repressive. In the early days of Islam, a revolution, some of these things were tolerated, but as any revolution settles down, the regime relaxes, but that uh, is the basic problem. Because he, in just the last bit, in 1997, uh, in election for the president, uh, Muhammad Khatami became president. He won 70% of the vote. The turnout was 88%, and he got the votes of many young people and women. And from 97 to 2005, in eight years of his presidency, Things were began to relax, you know, cultural and social freedoms were more, political freedoms were more. But, you see, that gave the whole system, shall I say, a relief, a breathing ground. And then with Ahmadinejad, he had trying to reverse that relaxation, and that's where the problem is. All right. Well, let's see. There's a lot to go over there. I guess I'd like to uh, ask you to... If you can uh, kind of elaborate on the, uh, as you mentioned, Katami there and some of the reformers in the 90s. Of course, uh, Rafsanjani is another famous uh, reformer. I think you say in your article that uh, Katami, 
uh, really had a reputation of uh, being a decent guy, whereas Ross and Johnny is really known kind of as a crook. So even though their politics are are more you know modernist and reformist, those two aren't necessarily allies, and and the the public perception of them in Iran is not the same, right? Absolutely. I think basically, you know, there are, of course there's a reformist camp and there's a conservative camp. In the conservative camp, there are three different sections. You know, just like if you take a Republican party, you know, you get the, you know, Rush Limbaugh, you know, and you get the, should I say, liberal uh, Republicans. So in the same way, among conservatives, uh, you have three parts. You know, one is what you may call a pragmatic conservative, uh, of uh, which is la- that section is laid by Rustin Johnny. He's not a reformist, he's a pragmatic conservative. Then you have a centrist, and the present uh, parliamentary speaker, Ali Larajani, is a centrist conservative. And then you have hardliners, Ahmadinejad and the social media, they are hardline conservatives. So I see, uh, when that election happened, say, 97, of course, the religious establishment and the Supreme Leader, they had their own man who was a speaker of the parliament at that time, Mr. Natek Nuri, and he was defeated. He only got 25% of the vote, whereas Katami got 70% of the vote, you see. And that showed two things. One, that the system is open, and two, that it is a republic of Iran. It's not Emirate of Iran, so the state of uh, Islamic state of Iran is Islamic Republic. That means power lies with the people. And so that uh, particular period really was, shall I say, you know, the, the good part of the system in Iran. Now, the last 2005 election is to one we should understand, because in that election, none of the seven candidates got 50% plus one vote. Therefore, there has to be a second run. Now, in that election, interestingly enough, uh, Rasanjani contested. Of course, he was president for two terms, but then if there's a break of the two terms, you can re-enter. You know, theoretically, Bill Clinton can contest because he was only two terms together. He can come back anyway. So the point is that Rasanjani got 21%, and then number two, surprise, surprise, mayor of Iran, not widely known, a gentleman called Mahmoud Unijad, he got a 19.5%. And number three was the Speaker of Parliament, Mahdi Karubi, who was a moderate reformist. He got 17.5%, only 2% behind. Now, immediately, I'm talking last election, 2005, four years ago. Immediately, Mahdi Karubi, who is also this, uh, uh, contested this time, he said, wait a minute. In the second largest city of Iran, it's found there was a uh, stuffing of uh, battle boxes. Secondly, the Basij militia, which is supposed to be neutral, they publicly canvass for Ahmadinejad. And thirdly, the son of the Supreme Leader, Mujtaba Khamenei, he also publicly canvassed for Ahmadinejad. That is wrong. And immediately, Supreme Leader said, shut up. You are creating tension. And, of course, uh, Mr. Karubi, who was until that moment official advisor to Khamenei, he resigned immediately. Now, you see, what happened was, in the 2005 election, there was minor-scale rigging. That is, they, I mean, in reality, uh, Mahdi Karubi was number two. You know, and so they pushed up uh, Ahmadinejad and put him number two, because then in the second uh, in the second run, he won, because Rastanjani is not a proper reformist. He is a... Uh, Bradman conservative and he and his family are corrupt. Everybody knows. They have a lot of money, oil, and so on and so forth. You see, so, so you can see what happened now is a continuation of the same game, i.e., and this is my thesis, which is that when Khamenei had a reformist president for eight years, he had a lot of problems. He had to, you know, control things. He had to do with, the, of course, heavy hand, even though within the Constitution, and he said to himself, this is too much, this is too much of a headache. I will not allow another reformist to come in. And that's why Mahdi Karubi, who had a good chance of beating Rasul Jani, because Mahdi Karubi is, is a straight guy, he's not corrupt, he's a reformist. And see, but when he, he was booted out, then a lot of reformists in 2005, in the second run, did not vote. And that's how 
uh, Amazon does run by a big margin because, you know, a lot of people said, oh, my God, Rafanyani is not a proper reformist. He's also corrupt. And, see, and so you can see the continuation. Uh, what has happened this time is the large scale rigging. The drawdown was four years ago. Well, so now uh, with the recent election, um, I guess, uh, well, there's there's a lot of competing information. On one hand, everybody says that, you know, there was a, more than 100% of the vote counted in every precinct, and it was the biggest theft of an election in the history of all mankind. And then on the other hand, the poll said that, uh, you know, like uh, the uh, Rockefeller Brothers Fund poll there, the New America Foundation poll, said that Ahmadinejad was going to win. And actually, I'm kind of conflicted, too. I'll go ahead and work in this uh, to my question somehow here. Um and some people are saying, you know, regardless of the degree to which, and maybe no degree, I don't know, but, you know, people argue that there's a degree to which the CIA here is is backing the uh, color revolutionaries, the green revolutionaries, and that kind of thing. On the other hand, uh, it seemed to me in the run-up to this recent election that uh, the CIA was having Jundullah blow up a bunch of things, uh, and, you know, if there can be any rhyme or reason ascribed to the goofballs that run the CIA these days... It seems like the purpose of that would be to help Ahmadinejad, that they would prefer to have the right winger in there uh, so that they don't have to deal with him. Because, or else, why would why would having uh, Jundullah set off a bunch of bombs help the opposition to the current government? You know, that doesn't make any sense. No, I think, I think when you mention the CIA, I think actually there's an interesting book by James Rice in the New York Times uh, Security correspondent who wrote a book on Iran in which he explained, he, he gave a history of the CIA. What had happened was the CIA had, of course, set up its network in Iran, and that network was uh, exposed in uh, 2002. Uh, there was one particular agent who was a double agent in Iran, and uh, he was given the names of all the whole network, and he, of course, you know, gave the information to the regime, and the regime totally destroyed the CIA network, this will be in 2002, and see, and after that, uh, you found, I mean, not, uh, you found, I mean, after, after that, it was seen that uh, a lot of uh, drones, uh, USA drones were flying uh, all over Iran, and people were saying, oh, we are called UFOs, you know, <laughs> identified flying objects, and of course, the regime knew who they are, in fact, and uh, so they would uh, say, yes, these are, uh, you know, we are keeping track of these things. At the same time, they would not shoot them down because if they did the shooting, then uh, the Pentagon and the National Security Agency, they would know their air defense system. So anyways, point is, if it's the question of CIA network, the CIA network was basically destroyed four years ago, uh, and that is why... Uh, the USA, uh, you know, the establishment in uh, Washington did not have proper information about the nuclear program, and that's why they went to Pakistan, if you want to connect the two stories, and Pakistan said, yes, we can allow U.S. special forces to go in from Pakistan area into Iran, because Pakistan and Iran have common border, and they can go in and, you know, uh, dip, uh, what you call uh, uh, deposit or fix certain uh, instruments which can tell you what's in the air and if there's a nuclear stuff or not. And that was the deal done. If you want to connect certain things, uh, I'm sure a lot of people remember that um, there was a Dr. A.Q. Khan, uh, Pakistan's uh, you know, father of a bomb, and he came out in February 2004 and said, oh, you know, I did actually... Did something very bad and wrong, but you know it was only me involved. Nobody else was involved. And, uh, and Musharraf then General Musharraf just put him under house arrest. He said this was a deal with the Bush administration. I uh, don't push us on um, uh, A.Q. Khan. Don't push us that he will be interviewed by the CIA. And for that, we'll allow CIA special forces to go in overground from our uh, territory into Iran and, you know, install these uh, instruments to keep track of the nuclear program. You see, so what I'm saying is that the whole idea of the CIA is somehow involved in this thing. I mean, no, I, quite honestly, I don't take this seriously. All you have to do is, you know, read this book by James Rison, and of course, James Rison is not somebody who's making up things, <laughs> I assure you. The New York Times, you know, because bottoms uh, have a certain reputation. Okay, I think I think see, see 
there are there are some you know if this were a court case you know, the, you, the ground jury immediately say indict. Well, I mean, some basics are very simple. It's not a question of more than 100% because they are explaining that in Iran, if you have your identification, and no matter where you are, you can go to the polling station, show your ID, and vote anywhere. And of course, you know, you, you, you get the ink on your finger so you can't vote again. And um, See, that, that has been explained because it's easy to explain. Of course, in 50 cities it happened, that's too much. That's the more interesting, important point. One is that in all elections, what you have to do by law, that uh, the agents of the different candidates, they come, go to each polling station, the polling officer opens every ballot box, shows them this is empty, then seals it. That did not happen this time. <laughs> I'm just giving you one simple example. That didn't happen. Secondly, amongst the uh, uh, candidates, uh, Mohsen Ghazai, Mohsen Ghazai actually is the former commander of the Revolutionary Guard. He said, I have been given 650,000 votes. Now, since this thing has happened, 900,000 people have sent me the email, and they have given me the ID numbers, and they have said, we have voted for you. So there are 900,000 uh, witnesses to say, we gave you a vote, and on the other hand, 650,000 votes. I'm just giving you two examples. There are three or four other examples. Now, the election law allows up to three days, up to 72 hours, if, in between the closing of the polls and the result being uh, you know, collected and counted and recounted and then announced. This time, lo and behold, within two hours, of the polls closing at midnight uh, of the 12 and 13 June, they announced the result. I mean, you know, this is unbelievable. I mean, I mean, this is, you know, I mean I'm, I'm just giving you some basics. Sure, if sure. If you were to go to the grand jury and say, this is my you know, prima facie case, these are the basic evidence I have, they will immediately indict the person who is being accused. You know, on the other hand, on the other hand, doesn't it, sort of at least look like they stole an election they were going to win anyway i mean at least some of the portrayal is that the the young uh reformer minded uh kiddos in tehran uh number in the hundreds of thousands sure but they're not the majority in the country the majority of the country is just like in america in the cities people vote democrat out in the country they vote republican for the most part that kind of thing yeah, I think on that figure, the figure is that 70% of Iranian population, that's what I said earlier, Iran is a fairly developed industrial society. You know, it's not like Burma or it's not like Pakistan, I can assure you. See, 70% of people are urban in Iran. 70% are urban. Only 30% live in villages. That's one. Secondly, of course, I mean, Tehran itself is a divided city. It is one city which, uh, the avenue which runs east west, which is in fact called Freedom Avenue, Azadi Avenue. That is the uh, device north from the south. North is the one which is secular, westernized, and the other ones who have, you know, in it, uh, Twitter and all kinds of things. Fair enough. I mean, and the south is uh, uh, definitely not. Uh, in the same way. But you see, even among young people, of course, the Basij, not Basij are not all old, old fellows, Basij are young as well. Sure. So I, I would say that, I mean, a general figure, maybe 20 to 25 percent people are with the regime. Now, they are not to the regime to the extent to go out and fight for it and even die for it. See, and on the other hand, you probably have 25 to 30 percent people who are totally opposed to the system, but they are not going to go out you know, and fight because they don't have the guns and this is not the way to do certain things. And they do not want to overthrow the system. They simply want the system to adjust to reality. You know, if, if the demographic change is going a certain way, if a, a man and women, you know, are attracted naturally to each other, you know, to put a restriction that you can't hold hands unless you're married and you show your marriage certificate uh, unless the morality police will take you to the police station. I mean, this is, you know, this, this is, uh, you know it's, it, it goes against uh, nature, human nature, you see. And you see, so in, in itself, uh, the people run the regime looking inwards and say, let's see, what are we doing wrong? Or what is the way to reach out to young people? How should we you know, maintain uh, and, uh, you know, cooperate, the cooperation and cooperation with the system. Instead of that, 
they basically, again, they remember, I go back to martyrdom, which I mentioned in my book. They are not killing too many people. Remember that. See, most of the shooting of the ammunition is in the air. I know. And so they want to frighten people. They want to beat them and, you know, and have lots and presence of the security forces so that everybody is afraid. But they are very keen not to do things on a you know, huge scale, kill people, and then martyrdom will take off. And that is another important point to keep in mind. Right. Well, now, so where exactly do we stand? Because, uh, you know, the last I heard, Mousavi is still not giving in and doing his, you know, Al Gore uh, concession speech. And yet the protests have more or less died down, it seems like, uh, you know, uh, Khomeini and uh, Ahmadinejad aren't going anywhere, at least for now. Do the people who've been protesting, are they all in terrible danger now that they've lost? No, I think what will happen, see, this happened before. See, again, in 1999, there were student protests on a smaller scale, but the, uh, they did exactly the same thing in 1999. I, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, were used, et cetera, et cetera, and then started arresting student leaders and this and that. So, you see, again, now they are doing the same thing. I, arresting people and uh, singling out something, and then you have a confession, oh, I was misled by the BBC or CNN, et cetera, et cetera. See, this is in a way, what's happening is, you see, remember that, I, I have to repeat that. It's not, of course, this time happened in a very big way, but exercise had been done before. In 1999, smaller scale, smaller scale student protest was repressed in a particular way. This time, in a magnified way, they're using the same tactics. Then a small uh, tinkering with the electoral process was done in 2005, this time on a large scale, you see. So, therefore, the people who are on the top, they think they will can manage this time as well. But what they are not able to grasp is that the trend, the long-term trend is against them because more and more people who are uh, growing up have no idea what was before. They are not going to go away. They still have access to the Internet. They can, even though uh, satellite dishes are uh, banned, they can watch uh, foreign uh, TV on Internet and so on and so forth. So I think that you cannot stop. And they, you know, and therefore, that is my basic argument, that the demographic change is against this rigid way of making things work. Secondly, which they are not able to understand, you cannot recreate the atmosphere and the environment and the social behavior of the early days of the Islamic Revolution because the conditions in 79, 80, 81 were totally different from what is the case in 2009, 2010. Things are totally changed. So, so you know, you cannot therefore say, ah, oh, we have to go back to the old days when people were very puritanical and they were all uh, uh, full of uh, revolutionary feeling, etc., etc. I mean, you have a particular feeling or something, because you are reacting to something. They were the Shah, the dictator Shah, the secular. He was in the pocket of America. He was, the system was corrupt, and people were making out of money or oil, and, you know, rich people, and, uh, you know, and, and the poor people had absolutely no say in the system. None of that exists now. So, you know, that has changed. You see? So I think, and there, this is the kind of a you know, shall I say, you know, feeling which comes. And it's not only really with this revolution. You see, I mean, if you can look at another revolution, one of the things which uh, Fidel Castro constantly talked about, the revolution 50 years old in Cuba, how do we continue this feeling with young people? He openly discusses this. So that's the basic problem, but the basic problem can be solved if you take on board, have a debate, debate about it, and find, you know, uh, different ways of tackling something which is not going to go away. But instead of that, you have to repress, you have to create fear. But always being careful as a Shiite country not to kill too many people by using force. Intimidate them, beat them, and try to cut off uh, connections to the Internet. But again, I explained, you cannot totally... Uh, stop internet because it's a part of the industry, part of the business, and you cannot do that. If you do that, then your GDP goes down. So this is their problem. All right, remember, in four years, there'll be another election. Okay. <laughs> 
All right, everybody, that's Dilip Hero. He's uh, author of five books on Iran. The latest is The Iranian Labyrinth, Journeys Through Theocratic Iran and Its Furies. His uh, latest one with Tom Englehart at antiwar.com, uh, pardon me, original.antiwar.com slash Englehart is called The Weeks of Living Dangerously, The Clash of Islam and Democracy in Iran. Thanks very much for your time on the show today, Dilip. My, my pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. We'll be right back. Antiwar Radio, Chaos in Austin. <laughs> 